All right. Thank you very much. I think I can be heard now. Good morning, folks. How are you today? Wait, I'm sorry. Don't answer that all at once. Uh, it's great to see you. I'm so glad that we can get to worship together. You who are here in this room with me now and those of you who are worshiping with us online. I just met a lady who said she uh, was able to come uh, previously and wasn't able to while we've been online. And she's been worshiping with us online and came back again today. So uh, it is wonderful to have you who are online with us. I hope that you, if you can, if you live in, the, in our area, that you'll eventually work it out to be able to come and worship in person uh, so that we can get the benefit of you and your uh, participation as well as us helping you to worship. Uh, if you are here in the room, this is very helpful and it can be helpful to you too if you use it right. The connection card. There's a connection card in your worship program, also in the seat pockets of the chairs. Uh, you can use this to let us know you were in worship here today. You can use this for comments. You can use this especially for uh, requesting us to pray with you about things you're praying about. Please uh, fill it all out and then drop it in the offering box as you leave this morning, which is right through the center doors. Those of you who are worshiping online with us, we've prepared an online connection form that uh, you can find by following the link that you see on the screen right now, and that's found in the description of the YouTube of our YouTube channel. So please take care of that, uh, get it out of the way, and then we're ready to go the rest of the hour. I've got a lot to remind you of that's happening in our church life, in our, our church family, uh, so please listen fast, okay? First... Our video study, Biblical Citizenship in Modern America, has started this last Wednesday evening, but it's not too late for you to join. Just come out this Wednesday at 6.30. The group meets up in room 202. It is interpreted for the deaf, and it is available on Zoom So for you who are worshiping at home particularly. So uh, read your program, contact the church office if you need more information. If you are concerned about what life is like for young people today, you're smart, and uh, you uh, can do more than just wring your hands about it. You can help send a young person to a Christ in Youth conference this summer, which uh, is very, very beneficial for them. You'll find a table of key tags, kind of like, this is, this is the last time we did it, a picture of it. Uh, it looks uh, even better this time, but you'll find a table of key tags in the lobby today, each key tag has the name of a person who's going to CIY. Please stop by there, take a key tag, use that whenever you see it with your keys or how, wherever you put it as a reminder to pray for that person while they are at the conference. Now you might ask, well, how does that help? How does that help kids get to CIY? Well, we're asking for a $25 donation for each key tag to help cover the cost of conference uh, registration. They're quite expensive. So uh, if you're willing to donate $25, take a key tag. Use it as a prayer reminder. There is also, if you don't like that idea, there's also a Hire a Teen sign-up sheet out there, right? There is one, right? Okay. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't stop by the table this morning, and it wasn't there yesterday, but uh, uh, there's a sign-up sheet out there by which you can request a group of youth to come to your house, supervised by an adult, to do yard work or cleaning, or whatever you want them to do in return for a donation. Sending our youth to CIY would not be possible without the generous support of anchor members in these kinds of ways. So please look for that out in the lobby, and thank you very much for helping the young people. Speaking of kids, Vacation Bible School is just around the corner. The fun begins on July 6th, just a couple of weeks away. It'll be an evening VBS. You can see that it's got a really neat uh, farm theme, heyday, uh, and so to register your kids, go to the link that you see on the screen. It is also in your worship program, and read your program or call the office for more information. One more reminder about young people. Mountain View Christian Camp is just about ready to get into full swing, so now is the time to register your kids and, and yourself for the adult programs um, to take advantage of all the great spiritual experiences that Mountain View offers. Uh, and uh, you go to their website to do that. Finally, let me update the faith promises that we've made to support our mission works all around the world. On the 12th of June, most of us made promises 
to give support to our mission partners through our church. When we added all of those promises together, we said that over the next 12 months, we would give $79,700 plus dollars to mission work. However, since then, other people have added more promises so that now the total stands at $81,279. We went over the $80,000 mark. Yeah, you want to applaud. It's worth applauding. <laughs> Incredible. In this environment, are you kidding me? I, I really, I'm, leaders don't say these things ahead of time, but I was going to be happy if we got to $70,000, $75,000 because of, of how the bad economy is hyped, right? So 81279 Thank you to everybody who's joined in. If any of the rest of you would like to get in on the fun, today is the last Sunday to do that. Just pick up a promise card uh, from the center table back there through those doors, fill it out, turn it into me, or drop it in the offering box. If you are worshiping from home, we still have an online uh, faith promise form that you can access in the description through a link. Just uh, click the link. Or if you don't do that kind of stuff, contact the church office. We'll be glad to set it up for you. Also, remember that next Sunday is when we start fulfilling these new promises. Our faith promise year runs from July through June. So if you made a faith promise a few weeks ago, please start bringing that new promised amount next Sunday. If you're behind on the current missions year that we're almost at the very end of, you've got today through this coming Thursday to catch up if you want to do that. Now, how do we give around here? Lots of ways. Four of them are listed on the screen right now. Number four, uh, the offering box, as I said, is right back there through the doors. So please also drop your connection card in that box if uh, you want to throw an offering in there, uh, do that. Once again, thank you very, very much. Now, Ben Hayes will lead us in worship with the assistance of Margaret Wells. Please give them your attention, if you would. Good morning. I am glad to be worshiping with you this morning, and <clears throat> now that we're at the, finally at this moment, it takes some time to get to, uh, to worship uh, when it actually begins. And um, and I think with all, the, all that we have opportunity to do this week, um, let's center ourselves. I'll, I'll read uh, the imperatives from Psalm 37 for you very briefly. Do not fret. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. Refrain from anger. Wait for the Lord. And it ends with uh, verse 40. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. So we're, we've come today to wait upon the Lord, to serve him, but also to trust and move when he says to move and wait when he says to wait. Let's stand together and invite him here. Thou Almighty King, help us Thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all-glorious, or all-victorious, come and reign over us, Ancient of Days. Come Thou incarnate Word, gird on thy mighty sword our prayer attend come and thy people bless and give thy word success spirit of holiness on us descend come holy comforter thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour, thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, spirit of power, to the great one in three, eternal praises be, and 
gates evermore. Thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together 171. Higher ground. We'll sing all four verses. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. So praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where fears arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift us up and let us stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on. Verse 4. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. That song takes work, and so does following the Lord. And it's so wonderful to sing all of that with you this morning. Would you please be seated? It seems like it's a journey. I feel like we're climbing a mountain on that song. <laughs> but it's worth it. Let's sing 529. Sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Because there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. So we pray, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts 
hearts in praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place thanks margaret good morning it's good to see everyone this morning Hey, if anyone in the house today needs a, a pack for communion, there's an usher here who's ready and willing to, to give you one if you just give a hand raise. And uh, if you're at home, this is actually a really great time to, to grab some elements for the Lord's Supper that's coming up. We're going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And would you join me in standing for the reading of God's word? But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, you may notice an extra spring in my step today, and part of that is because of what happened on Friday. Friday, two days ago, I must confess, was a day that I never thought that I would see in my lifetime. I guess I had too little faith. Today is a day to wholeheartedly thank God. Thank God for hearing our prayers and blessing our efforts with victory in a 50-year struggle. I'm old enough to remember when Roe v. Wade came down from the Supreme Court, and we were all shocked that they would do such a thing. And unfortunately, in the interim, 60 million babies have been lost. But this reversal will reduce, it won't eliminate the number of abortions in our country, but it will reduce that number, and for that I'm very thankful. And regardless of that even, the law is the great teacher of our culture. Those people who do not uh, follow the Lord and follow the Bible get their morality, their moral standards from somewhere. And they tend to receive it through the law. If the Supreme Court says it's okay, then it must be okay, right? That's kind of the uh, approach. Well, the Supreme Court has said, nope, uh, it's not okay. And uh, that's a wonderful thing. I also thank God, and I hope you will too, for His amazing grace that forgives all of our sins, including those of people who have chosen abortion, women who chose abortion and now wish they'd never even known it was possible, God forgives them. His grace forgives men who have encouraged women in their lives to abort their babies, and they've now repented. Thank God that none of us is beyond the reach of His compassion and His mercy. He forgives all sin when we turn to Him. I thank God, and I hope you will too, for the incredible courage of Justices Alito, Barrett, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Thomas, and Roberts. Do you realize how much moral courage it took for them to do this? They have literally taken their lives in their hands. May God bless their names, their memories, and their lives. I thank God for Compass Care and CareNet, and Bethany, and Right to Life, and all the organizations who have worked tirelessly over the years to help women see that they have another path, that they don't have to do something that they'll likely regret for the rest of their lives. Friday was a good day. It was a very good day. As Matt Walsh, social commentator, said, I could not think of a better way to end Pride Month. So let's praise God today and thank Him, and then we'll get back to work at it. All right, on to uh, the passage Kyle read with us just a little bit ago. 
Forty years ago, David Flegelman of New York City was rushed to a local hospital with a stab wound, and uh, it was not from an act of anti-Semitism. Surprisingly, he was stabbed by a fellow congregant while in a meeting at his Brooklyn synagogue. According to police reports, Flegelman and another man argued over which of them knew the Scriptures better. And it got so heated that one of them stabbed the other. That's a good example of the fact that just because a person knows a lot about the Bible doesn't mean that they necessarily believe it's true enough to actually put it into practice. But why should we think that the Bible is true? What if the Bible is just a compilation of legends, as some people say? What if it's full of misinformation? Are we to accept it by blind faith? Do we as Christians really commit intellectual suicide, as some people accuse us of, when we accept the Bible as the blueprint for our lives? Or are there good reasons to accept it as what Jesus called it, the word of truth? Well, I am very happy to tell you today that you don't have to turn in your brains at the door when you come to church. Our faith is backed up by the evidence. So this morning, I want to share with you just some of the solid reasons why we as Christians can have confidence in the Word of God. Let's begin with some basic facts about the Bible. Understand that the Bible is a library or a collection of 66 books written by about 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years. It was begun in about 1,400 B.C., and it was finished in almost 100 A.D. Now, can you imagine a book written about medicine that was written over the last 1,500 years? You'd have contradictions galore, everything from bloodletting to blood transfusions. Or a book written about science over the last 1,500 years. At one point, it would say the world is flat. Another point, it would say, no, the world is round. The uh, earth is the center of the universe. No, uh, we don't have a center to the universe as far as we know. But the Bible was composed over a 1,500-year period, and there is absolute and complete consistency without contradiction and accuracy in it. The Bible touches on scientific and and historical truths and demonstrates its credibility in those areas. Now, you probably know that the Bible is divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Here's a passage. Please look at it with me from Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 9. Jesus, speaking to God, says, See... I have come to do your will. He's quoting an Old Testament passage there, and he says that was Jesus speaking. See, I've come to do your will. And then it says, he takes away the first to establish the second. In looking at the Bible, we need to understand that there is an old will and there is a new will, an Old Testament, a New Testament, an Old Covenant, a New Covenant. Let's say that you have a rich uncle, and back in... 2005, this very rich uncle wrote a will, and he did not know you very well, and so you were not included in that will. But in the last 15 years, you became acquainted with your uncle. Uncle, He grew to love you. He wrote another will in 2000, or 2020, and he included you in that will for $500,000. And then this year, he passed away. Which of those two wills will be in effect, praise God? The second will. You stand to inherit all that money because the new will supersedes the old will. Now, God had an old will, and we were not included in that will because only those who were completely obedient to the Ten Commandments would inherit eternal life, and none of us qualify. But... He nailed that old will to the cross and gives us a new will, a new covenant. Those who trust in Jesus Christ will be saved. And so we are a New Testament church. It's valuable to read the Old Testament because it's like an elementary tutor which leads us to the new. But we live under the authority 
of the New Testament. Now, the Bible claims to be the actual Word of God. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16 again. It says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, etc. What does he mean, inspired by God? Well, it doesn't mean that God just took over the writer's mind and dictated his word. If you could get in a time machine and go back to the first century and find the Apostle Paul in a prison uh, in Rome, sitting there writing, and you were to say, Paul, what are you writing? He wouldn't say, you know what, I don't know. It looks like maybe 1 Corinthians to me. I don't think God was supernaturally moving the pen in the writer's hand on the page or anything like that. Inspired by God means they use their own style, they use their own rhetoric, they use their own memory of events that had happened, but God supervised the process so that whatever they wrote would match the truth that He wanted revealed. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 suggests the same thing. No prophecy of Scripture ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You probably remember what Jesus told His disciples just before He died, just a day or two before He died. He said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And in John 16, verse 13, He said to them, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you men into all truth. Now, it's only logical that since God made us, He would want to accurately communicate to us His will. I remember so clearly when my first child was born, her name is Naomi, she was born at Highland Hospital. No, that's that's not true. She was born at Genesee Hospital, now that I think about it. I've got it wrong in my notes. Uh, Genesee Hospital. The doctor, uh, uh, they cleaned her up, then the doctor put her in my arms and he said, now don't drop her. And I was so awestruck, I didn't even catch that he was teasing me. I said, oh, I won't, I promise. But actually, I was a little afraid I would drop her. But... uh, Uh, I looked down at my newborn baby, and I began to talk to her, not in baby talk, but slowly and clearly so that she could understand me. I said, well, hello, Naomi. I'm your dad. I'm I'm so glad you're finally here. We're going to have a lot of fun together. We're going to do a lot of things together. You're going to go to church a lot in your life, but you're going to have a good time there. We're going to love it. And, and, you know, every father just has this immediate desire to want to communicate with his child. In fact, what do we call a father who doesn't want to have anything to do with his child? We call that father a deadbeat dad, right? So isn't it natural to assume that God, our Father and Creator, wants to communicate with us to show us the way? That's exactly what happened when God came down to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ to be with us, to reconcile us to Himself. And then He accurately communicated about His will for our lives in the Bible. When you open the Bible, you need to work hard at hearing God's voice because that's what it is. That's what it is. Now, how was the Bible compiled? How was it put together? Well, we know the Old Testament is God's Word because it was authenticated by Jesus, and Jesus rose from the dead, proving that everything He says is true. Jesus quoted from Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Deuteronomy. He called those, as He quoted them, the Word of God. Jesus also quoted from the Psalms and Isaiah and Micah and referred to them as the Scripture. Luke 24, verse 27, uh, we read, beginning with Moses, so all the way back at the beginning of the Bible, and all the prophets, so the entire Old Testament, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning Himself. But early church scholars used three strict criteria to determine which books should be included in the New Testament. Number one, they were to be written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. Mark was a close associate of Peter. Luke was a close associate of Paul. 
Number two, it must have been recognized by the early church as Scripture, the people who were closest to the time when it was written and who were able to verify the things that were in there. And then number three, everything that it said had to be doctrinally consistent with the other known Scriptures. We do not consider what is called the Apocrypha, books like Maccabees, Tobit, the Gospel of Thomas, Judith, to be God's Word. We don't consider them to be God's Word because they do not meet these three tests. By the way, I would challenge you as a Christian, become familiar with the order of the books of at least the New Testament so that you can repeat them out loud. Memorize their order. That way, when the teacher says, uh, let's turn to the book of Colossians, you're not embarrassed that it takes you five minutes to find it in your Bible. A soldier in boot camp learns to disassemble and reassemble his weapon blindfolded. And if we're serious about the things of God, we need to become familiar with our spiritual weapon. The Bible says the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. So become familiar with the books of the New Testament at least. Well, how do we know that the Bible is accurate? Josh McDowell, in his little book that I would highly recommend to you, called More Than a Carpenter, it sold millions of copies, Uh, he points out that there are three criteria used to determine if any ancient book is uh, legitimate or accurate or an accurate representation of what the author wrote, those kind of things. The first is the bibliographical test, which is the test of manuscript evidence. Of course, they didn't have Xerox copies or even printing presses back when the Bible was written or any ancient book, Uh, and so uh, they were all hand copied. So this is the test of the authenticity of the copies that we have since we don't have the original piece of parchment that John, say, sat down and wrote on, at least as far as we know, we don't have the original piece of parchment. McDowell points out that Aristotle wrote his poetics about 343 B.C., yet the earliest copy we have of the poetics is dated nearly 1,400 years later. Yet no one says, eh, I'm not sure this accurately represents what Aristotle wrote. Scholars accept it without question. Caesar wrote his History of the Gallic Wars Around 50 B.C., the earliest manuscript copy we have of that comes from about a thousand years later. Yet no one says, should we really think that Caesar wrote this? But when it comes to the manuscript authority of the New Testament, it's overwhelming in contrast. We have over 20,000 old manuscripts, some of them dating back to less than a hundred years after Jesus' time on earth. In fact, three ancient pieces of Matthew's gospel were found in storage at a college in Oxford, England just several years ago. Experts tested them and discovered that they date all the way back to 50 A.D., 20 years after Jesus uh, went back to heaven. And, it's, and, and that's amazing because the anti-Bible scholars had always said, well, the, the oldest manuscripts we have are from 100 A.D. And Matthew's gospel quotes Jesus as saying, uh, predicting the fall of Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 A.D. It occurred before the oldest copy we have of the gospel of Matthew. So since nobody can predict the future, we know that Matthew didn't really write this. It had to be written by somebody else, and it had to be written after 70 A.D. But these fragments of Matthew's gospel date from 20 years before the fall of Jerusalem. The manuscript evidence verifies the reliability of the Bible. Then there are the the internal tests. This is a test of the book's contents itself. And the Bible shows that it's reliable and it's prof- in, in that, first of all, its prophecies are fulfilled. Ecclesiastes 8, 7, the Bible says, uh, no man can predict the future. And we know that that's true. The weatherman can't predict where the hurricane's going to make landfall in five days. 
uh, or even whether we're really going to have snowfall in the winter or not sometimes. The pollsters can't really predict who's going to win the election. The Las Vegas odds makers can't really tell you who's going to win the ball game. But in Isaiah 46 verse 9, the Lord says, I am God and there's no one like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying, my plan will take place and I will do all my will. In other words, God says, I have a plan for this world. And so I know the future. It's going to unfold according to my plan. Let me give you an example or two. In Ezekiel 26, verse 4, the Bible predicted that the city of Tyre on the coast of the Mediterranean uh, in the Middle East would be destroyed, and God specifically said, I will scrape the soil from her and turn her into a bare rock. She will become a place in the sea to spread nets. Now, maybe you've read about what Aristotle, not Aristotle, I already talked about Aristotle, Alexander the Great did in that part of the world. Hundreds of years after that was written, Alexander the Great came and he leveled the city of Tyre. But the inhabitants of Tyre evacuated and escaped to uh, a little island about 100 or 200 yards off the, the uh, coast in the Mediterranean Sea. So Alexander the Great ordered his men to pick up the rubble of the city they had just destroyed and throw it into the sea. And they built a causeway from the coast out to that island in order to capture the people who had evacuated out there onto that island. And still today, that causeway is there. It is used by fishermen to dock their boats and spread their nets. It came true exactly the way the Bible predicted. Or think about all the predictions in the Old Testament about a coming Messiah. Now, we know that those Old Testament predictions were written before the time of Jesus, because in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and through carbon-14 date testing, it's been determined that they were written hundreds of years before the time of Christ. And yet, those Old Testament scriptures said such things as, a Messiah is coming. He will be born in Bethlehem. He will be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. He will be executed between thieves. They will cast lots for his clothing. He will be buried in a borrowed tomb. He will raise from the dead. There are hundreds of prophecies about the Messiah, all fulfilled by Christ, all written uh, without doubt hundreds of years before he lived. Now, some of you heard this before, but mathematician Peter Stoner of Pasadena Co uh, College did some calculating, and he said the odds of only eight of those predictions about Jesus coming true accidentally in one person are about one in 10 to the 157th power. That's 1 over 10 with 156 zeros after it. To illustrate that, he said this, let's uh, cover the entire, let's imagine that we covered the entire state of Texas, Mary Lee, in silver dollars two feet thick. Okay? The entire state of Texas. Mark one silver dollar. Now blindfold a man and let him parachute over that entire state covered in silver dollars. He gets to pick up one silver dollar. The odds of him picking up the dollar that we mark with an X are the same odds as only eight of those prophecies coming true accidentally in one person. But Jesus did it. In fact, there were hundreds of prophecies that he fulfilled. Its prophecies are accurate. No man can predict the future. This is the word of God. We can trust it. And its facts are accurate too. Examine the Bible, you're overwhelmed by how accurate it is. Sometimes people say, well, I don't believe the Bible because it's full of contradictions. I always like to ask them, exactly what contradictions are you talking about? They never know. They've just heard somebody else say that. And there really aren't many even apparent contradictions, but most of them are explained by understanding geography or customs of that day. For example, here's a supposed contradiction. I'll give you one. 
Mark 10, verse 46, Mark wrote, Then they came to Jericho, and as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting by the road. Now Luke tells the same story in the 18th chapter of his gospel, and it reads, As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Mark says they were leaving Jericho when they met Bartimaeus. Luke says as they entered Jericho, they met Bartimaeus. Now that is such a minor, you know, uh, difference, just a tiny detail that doesn't really make any difference. But people say, no, 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 it's supposed to be inspired by God. It's supposed to be the Word of God. It's supposed to be accurate. It shouldn't contradict itself. Well, as I said, uh, when we understand the geography and the customs of that day, the difficulty is often immediately cleared up. Archaeologists have discovered that there were two Jerichos right next to one another. There was old Jericho and there was new Jericho, kind of like we've got Henrietta and West Henrietta. And the meeting ground between the two was a place where many people would gather. So Jesus could easily have been leaving one Jericho and about to enter the other when he met Bartimaeus. It's internally consistent. Then there are external tests. There's the historical verification, for example. Flavius Josephus was a Jewish historian from the first century. He was born in 37 AD, and uh, in his writings, he refers to Jesus Christ. Quote, Annas convened the judges of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus who was called Christ. Roman historian Tacitus in A.D. 112 referred to Jesus this way, Christus, or Christ, was put to death by Pontius Pilate. Now, that's not a Christian talking. That's an enemy of Christianity talking. There are many references from first century, uh, first century historians outside the Bible that back it up. Then there's the archaeological verification. Remember when Pharaoh ordered the Israelites to make bricks without straw as a punishment on them? Well, they've discovered in Egypt an ancient wall where the bottom several tiers of bricks are made with straw the standard way. The middle section of the wall above that bottom section, the middle section is bricks made with stubble and the top section are bricks made without any straw or stubble at all. Probably just a coincidence, right? This past March, I don't know if you heard about it, some archaeologists reported that they dug up in Israel a small folded lead tablet, two centimeters by two centimeters. When they read it, they were shocked to find it was in Hebrew text and it included the Hebrew name of God twice in 40 words. They were shocked because it is hundreds and hundreds of years older than any known Hebrew inscription from ancient Israel previously found. It's at least 3,000 years old and probably closer to 5,000 years old. See, anti Bible scholars have insisted that Moses could not have written anything in the Bible. He did not write the first five books of the Bible because the Hebrew alphabet did not even exist when he was alive, they say. There's no evidence the Hebrew alphabet even existed, they said. In f so they say that the earliest that the books of Genesis and Exodus and so on were written uh, was about 300 to 500 years before Jesus was born. They say those things, of course, to try to make people believe the Bible's just a made-up story. But here we now have a lead tablet proving that the Hebrew alphabet was in use in the time of Moses and before, and it includes the actual name of God on it twice. John Haggai reminds us that Jesus said to the Pharisees, if my disciples don't testify to me, the rocks will cry out. 
Haggai says, people are trying to suppress the testimony about Jesus today, and the archaeologists are discovering that the rocks are crying out, giving testimony to the Lord. When W.C. Fields was on his deathbed, he was reading the Bible, and a friend came to visit him and was shocked, said, W.C., what are you doing reading the Bible? He said, just looking for loopholes, my friend, just looking for loopholes. Oh, I hope he wasn't. You can read the Bible and look for loopholes. Or you can look at the Bible honestly, fairly, with an open mind, examining the evidence regarding its authenticity, and then accept it with an informed faith. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Then the Bible says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. If you have trouble believing, don't read other books about the Bible. Read the Bible itself. And Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that they, in them you have eternal life, but the scriptures testify about me. It's not the book that we worship. It's the Christ of the book. Robert Fulgham wrote a book entitled, Every, I, I, uh, All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. You know what? There's a sense in which all you ever needed to know for salvation, you learned in the preschool department at church when you sang that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The message of that song is probably not going to impress the intellectuals and the philosophers of our age. But who are we trying to impress anyway? I hope you're trying to impress the God of the universe who sent his son to die on a cross for you to give you eternal life. That's the message of the Bible from front to back. God loves you. He wants you to be with him forever. But he will not force you to spend eternity with him in heaven. He honors your choices. So choose to put your trust in him. And if we can help you to do that, if we can show you from the Bible how to go about that, we want to do that. So on the green connection card that I had you fill out earlier, there's a place where you can mark, I'd like to know more about becoming a Christian, or I'd like to to know more about becoming a member of this church, or whatever applies in your situation, whatever you sense God is moving you to do. And He is interacting with all of us right now, if we'll listen for it. If you're worshiping with us from home, we have the, the online connection form on the second page, there are similar ways you can get our attention and ask for help with these things, and we'll be glad to help you any way that we can. It would be our honor. Uh, you, if you're here today, you can say something to me after worship. You can, you can request things by mail or email or whatever, but please let us know if we can help because we want to, and that's why we exist, in fact, as a congregation, to help people find their way to the Lord just like somebody's helped us find our way to the Lord. And so it's our honor to do that. You won't be bugging us. You won't be putting us out. You'll be thrilling us if you say, can, I, uh, can you help me with this? So please let us know. All right? Now we're going to uh, uh, move in our worship to really probably the pinnacle, the high point of our worship as God has designed it, and that is to remember His Son the way He asked us to at His table. Everybody's welcome to take part. Uh, And I hope you will if you can do it to honor Christ. Ben? Please sing with us hymn 191, Near the Cross. keep me near the cross there a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till 
captured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross O lamb of god bring its scenes before me help me walk from day to day with its shadows o'er me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the Have you ever seen something really grungy be restored? Isn't that satisfying when something gets put back together right? You know, all the original parts are put back in. It's, it's made whole or the way it was in the first place. But what I find even better than that is when something is renewed but also upgraded a little bit, right? You know, it's just like the original, but that part that always goes bad, well, it was remachined or remanufactured the right way, the way they wish they had done it the first time. That's pretty cool. Uh, some of the original faulty pieces, you know, it's just trial and error until you get to know which parts don't work. And so when you, when you redo something, uh, you know, whether it's an automobile or a motorcycle, if you've talked to Alan about his motorcycle, Mr. Wells is, you know, stoked about some of the things he's done to it. I, I enjoy doing this, and my dad enjoys doing this as well. And I got an opportunity to, uh, with a house that I was renovating and res well, restoring and renovating and kind of renewing, uh, I, I flipped the house. And so I've talked to many of you from first service about this. And so I'd actually, I, I'll show you a couple pictures if uh, Elijah can put it up there. Isn't that beautiful? Didn't I do a great job? <laughs> okay, no, these are the, uh, the before uh, pictures, but I really want to show you the before pictures because I want to uh, make my work look better when it gets done. <laughs> Wasn't that nasty though? Look at that basement, just full of garbage. And now the house, before I got it, uh, there was a dumpster outside and the people who lived there were just feeling, feeling that dumpster over and over. And so that's what it looked like before, right? And, and all that stuff was in there and left in there after they took dumpster loads of things out. When I originally got to the house the first time, we could barely wade through every piece of garbage and every tote full of cat litter box uh, with everything inside of it. Just crazy stuff, you know. And when you got to the basement, you'd have to step off the third or fourth step up into the garbage to, to walk down there to get to, you know, the things that are really important, you know, the breaker box and and looking at the sump pumps, you're walking through garbage and spreading. It was amazing, right? But I saw some some potential in it. And so um, it, it didn't, it, that's the crazy part. It didn't really happen all at once, too. You know, you know how that house got in bad shape, you know? Someone put something in the basement that really should have gone in the dumpster. Then they didn't clean up a spill over there. And then there was a leak, but they just patched it and didn't do a good job. And it was one thing after another, right? And that's how it got really bad. Didn't all happen overnight, I'm sure. And so, of course, seeing it, I'm thinking, well, fixing this up is not going to happen overnight either. Uh, so here's a couple of the slides that uh, will show some of the restoration I did. So a lot of little things, power washing and redoing the driveway, putting in floors and painting and light fixtures and backsplash and new countertops and painting everything and remodeling the bathroom and, you know, putting in granite countertop sinks and just all kinds of stuff, right? Hours and hours and hours, days, weekends, 
you know, months it took me to, to kind of get everything out and then fix it all up. So um, that's basically what it looks like now. But we staged it a little bit so that I could sell it because I didn't want to, you know, live there, but I want to you know, fix it and sell it. So now it's got beds and some wall hangings and things like that. So thanks for flipping through those, Elijah. But wow, man, I knew from day one, I knew it looking at that old junkie house, I said, there's some value in that. There's something there. We, you know, we're going to have to rip everything out, and then we're going to have to replace things, and then we're going to have to fix things. And slowly but surely, we're going to make this thing great again. And so down to the tiniest little detail, uh, <laughs> we fixed everything, every outlet, <laughs> you know, every light fixture, every switch in the house, you know, every piece of vents even. We had to paint the vents, everything, right? Every little detail. But... Um, Sometimes it felt kind of like the house was fighting back. <laughs> it almost felt like the house didn't want to change. You know, some things were stuck, and I'm thinking, how is this stuck this way? I looked at the addition they had built 20 years ago or something, and uh, some of the positives were hooked to the negatives electrically, <laughs> right? So it's like shorting all the time. There could be fires at any point. You know, I flicked on the garbage disposal at one point, and blue sparks flew all over the kitchen. I'm like dodging it as I'm trying to turn it off. And I'm thinking, why does this house not want to change? But it's obviously just a house, right? It just, it's just a house, you know, it can be fixed. It can be fixed. And so I was willing to pay a, a significant price for the house. And then I fixed it up to the point where it was so much more valuable after the effort that I put into it. And this is exactly what Jesus does with us. You know, scripture says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us because he knew, he knew there was value in us. He was our creator, right? He, he knows us more than we even know ourselves. And so he saw a value in us and he said, I can restore that. And even though it's going to feel like it's fighting back sometimes, I can fix this. And so he sees our value and he sees that we can be restored and also renewed and made better through Jesus even to the point of giving his life, he was willing to pay the price for us. His body was broken. His blood was shed. And so when we come to communion time, we remember what he did for us. We remember that he saw value in us. And we remember his sacrifice, that he was willing to even sacrifice his body and, and his life for us. And Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters... In view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. You see, Jesus was willing to die for us. He's willing to offer his body because that was the will of the Father. You remember in the garden when he's asking, may this cup be passed from me, but not my will, your will be done. And now it's urging us in Romans to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice so that we can understand the will of God. Isn't that interesting? And so we might see ourselves as a house, and honestly, sometimes I feel like a house where I'm at the start, you know, I'm at the starting phase where you're ripping bad things out. Sometimes I feel like Jesus is doing that and he's still ripping out the bad. And some days I feel like he's, he's doing the finishing touches, right? He's grouting the backsplash and saying, oh, this is going to sell. This is looking good. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I need the driveway redone and I need the yard mow, the basic things still. But wherever you're at in your restoration journey, Jesus sees value in you. And so today, we take these elements and we remember that. We remember that his body was broken for all of us. You know, people out there who are completely lost and confused. People who are up on the stage, me, Mr. Backus, Ben. All of us, Christ sees value in us and he died for us. So as we go to communion today, we remember what Jesus was willing to do, the price that he was willing to pay for us. And so let's take a moment uh, to reflect on that and then we'll take these together.
Would you pray with me? God, you are so good to us, <laughs> way, way better than we deserve. And in moments where we, we doubt our value, we look to the cross and, and we thank you for, <laughs> for the value you've placed on us and in us because of your son. We're grateful for the opportunity to share you with this community that we're in, with this, this world. And people are so lost and so confused. And, and especially right now in our country, it, it seems like we've maybe lost our way. Um, but you still value us. And you're still there for us. And you still offer us grace and mercy. And we are so eternally grateful for that. So we come here today to take these elements, to remember Jesus, to honor you, and to show you that we're willing to give up anything to follow you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We take this bread to remember Jesus' body that was broken for us. We take this juice to remember his blood that was shed for us on the cross. I'd like to have you just stay in your seats for a moment. We'll um, continue this at at atmosphere and attitude of God's transformation before we leave. 186. Let's invite the Lord to, to move in and through us. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Please mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Amen. Would you stand together? Let's, let's close in a prayer. Father, you have allowed us to worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray that the, uh, the results of our being in your presence the fruit of that will be evident both to ourselves, to our spirit, and to those that we encounter this week. I pray that we will continue to re receive strength from your presence as it goes with us, and uh, we ask a blessing on our congregation. In the name of Jesus, amen.